Good evening. I want to welcome you to another session of Treasures of Truth here at Lighthouse Christian Fellowship uh, this Friday, uh, May 22nd. And uh, we were looking forward to hearing from uh, Pastor Kathy McBride uh, this Sunday morning. So just a reminder of that. I have a few announcements I'll probably give at the end of um, my, my session to, tonight. And then tonight I'm going to be sharing, uh, speaking out uh, to answer another question from, that's been sent to me through the email. Um, I appreciate those when they come because uh, it kind of inspires me to dig into something that maybe I wouldn't be. Typically I'm just you know, asking God what specific things he would have me to share on and I tend to be a kind of a mini-series type person so I'll be getting into sections of scripture. As a matter of fact, starting uh, later on in the next week, uh, I'm going to be uh, starting a series call, from, called Gems from J James uh, as we look into the book of James and uh, you know, discover really the book of James is primarily about how to deal with trials. And uh, of course, we're in a time of trial and tribulation. Uh, it's been worse at other times in life, uh, probably for individuals listening to this and as a, as a nation. Uh, but we're going to be looking at how to deal with trials. You know, when we end up in trials, it's, the, it's what the Bible calls the fire. And, uh, you know, when, when you end up in the fire is when you really know where your faith is at. Our faith gets tested when we're in, when we're in the fire. And uh, how I respond and react during difficult times, during trials and tribulations, you know, really exposes the depth and the level of my faith. And so we're going to be going through uh, sections of James. I'm not going to be doing it verse by verse, but just going through and gleaning out some of the points and principles and truths uh, that James teaches uh, in, the, in, the, in the book of James. Uh, tonight, I want to talk about a topic that uh, this phrase even may be very unique to you. Uh, it is to me. I'd heard it before and I had an idea what it was about, uh, but uh, I had a question asked this week concerning uh, imprecatory prayers, imprecatory prayers. And the question, uh, in a nutshell, is this. Is there ever a time when we should pray the imprecatory prayers found in the Psalms? Is there ever a time that we should pray the imprecatory prayers found in the book of Psalms? I will define that for you in a minute. I'll bring that down into uh, more clear English so uh, it won't be a surprise to you as to what we're talking about. But the question was asked in the context of the current events that are going on, and in particular, you know, as, uh, as, as the uh, uh, social distancing, but as the stay-at-home orders uh, are continuing to be in place uh, for uh, businesses, and the church in particular was what this question was asked about. And, you know, there are places where it seems like, depending on who the governor is and who the leadership is of a particular state, they're more lenient, they're encouraging things to happen, they're encouraging the church to get out and meet, you know, precautionary-wise, yes, but still go ahead and meet. There are even, uh, uh, there are even uh, those in leadership that when, uh, you know, someone seems to be uh, 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 taking a stand that's limiting the church, those in our federal government that are standing up, coming forth, uh, even the Attorney General Barr and said, listen, we're not going to put up with this limiting the church and picking out the church to not be able to you know, meet as, and, and gather as other uh, groups might be gathering at this time and so on. So the question was really about that and uh, uh, how should we respond if we happen to be in a region or in a state, and we are here in New York, uh, you know, where the governor has extended the limits and it's keeping us from being able to meet together and, you know, we, we, there's a sensing in some folks maybe that, you know, this is being done intentionally or with ulterior motives. Um, you know, when is it that we should come and pray some of the prayers that David prayed in the book of Psalms concerning his enemies? And so uh, let me first just define this term imprecatory so you'll get a, get a drift of what I'm talking about here tonight. Imprecatory is a prayer of judgment upon another person. It's a prayer containing evil to befall on a person or to invoke a curse on oneself or another person. So in essence, an imprecatory prayer would be a, a prayer of judgment where you're actually praying uh, toward or for an individual uh, that God would bring his judgment upon them. And one of the, uh, there's a number of places in Psalms that this takes place, 
the, probably the most common one is in Psalm 109. And so I want to read just a portion of Psalm 109. I, for, for time's sake, I don't want to read the whole thing. But Psalm 109 begins with the first five verses. And, you know, David's kind of talking about the predicament uh, that he's in. Uh, you know, the, the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have been opened against me. He's, he's kind of defining that there are those that are coming against him. And, uh, you know, they've got evil intentions and motives and so on and so forth. And verse 5 says, Thus they, they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. And then it picks up in verse 6, and I want to read verses 6 through 14, although this prayer that David is praying goes beyond verse 14. You really want to read the whole chapter yourself. But in verse 6 he says, Set a wicked man over him, meaning the one who is persecuting me, set a wicked man over him, and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Verse 11, let the creditor seize all that he has, and let strangers plunder his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him, nor let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. And verse 14, let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not, let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. I mean, these are pretty intense prayers that are being prayed by David. Again, there's other, if you've read the Psalms before and uh, you may not be able to put your finger exactly where they are, but you've read verses like that where, where, where you know, in this case, David is really, uh, he, he's really he's praying and he's asking God to judge people. He's asking God to bring judgment upon them. And these are some pretty heavy things. I mean, let their children be fatherless. Basically, he's praying a prayer that whoever this is that's coming against me, uh, Lord, that you'd take them out. And so the question that I was asking, I think it's a great question, uh, is, you know, in this day that we're living in, and of course, the times that we're in today uh, are, are difficult, and, and, and uh, trials and uh, circumstances that are not favorable, at least for us from a, a personal standpoint, they might be health-wise or whatever, but, uh, you know, we're not liking the limitations, we're starting to get old of not being able to go to the house of the Lord and worship together, and so, you know, this question was asked of me, you know, I... Basically, what I'm reading between the lines is they're saying, you know, I don't trust the judgment and I don't trust the motive of those that are making the decisions that are keeping me or us from being able to come to the house of the Lord and worship and study the word and fellowship the way that we have in the past. And so therefore, you know, should, should or could I be praying prayers of judgment against these people that God would remove them, get them out of office, put somebody else in there that's going to be more favorable with the church and so on. That's it's kind of my interpretation of what I was hearing. And so I want to address that matter this evening. I want to talk about imprecatory prayers. And as, as I always do, uh, I want to look to the scriptures for the answers. And so what I'm going to give you tonight is some scriptures to help you to determine which way you're going to go in your prayer life, okay? I'm not here to say to you, you got to do this or you can't do that. Um, I believe the Lord gives us his word as a guide. He gives us his spirit as a teacher. And uh, that as I give the word, the Lord said to me, he says, feed my sheep. As I give you the bread of the word of God, that you can then take it, you can pray and seek God's wisdom as to how these scriptures fit into the question you might be asking in this matter or these imprecatory prayers to guide you into how God wants you to be praying today concerning these events, concerning these actions, and concerning these people. So there's six, six things I want to look at here, and so I'm going to move along pretty quickly. But again, I'm going to leave you with the Scriptures, okay, with Scriptures. And all of these are New Testament Scriptures, save one. And the one that is in Genesis, you'll understand why I didn't use a New Testament Scripture there. Uh, but I, I do believe that when it comes to things that are in the Old Testament, we always need to interpret Old Testament uh, scriptures in light of the New Testament. And so uh, not going back and, and making doctrines out of Old Testament verses that I can't find any relationship to anything in the New Testament uh, is, is something that I stay away from. So I'm giving you these New Covenant scriptures as a means of interpreting 
uh, scriptures from the Old Testament. And those of you that go to the lighthouse or set in under any of my teachings know that I, I emphasize that a lot. Okay, the first thing is, uh, I believe God is calling us, and I shared uh, just the other night on Wednesday night, I talked about apprehending the upward call, if you remember right. Apprehending the upward call. God has not just called us to be born again. God has not just called us to be spending eternity with Him. God has called us to a high calling. God has called us to righteousness. God has called us to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. God has called us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. God has called us to walk in the, not only the event of salvation when we were born again, but the process of salvation as we are being transformed. There's, a, there's an upward call of God. And, and uh, we, we looked at that in, in Philippians 3 about apprehending and laying hold of the high call of God in Christ Jesus, and that was Philippians uh, 3, uh, I think verses 5 through 14, if I remember correctly, uh, but then verse 15 says this, which we didn't look at, it says, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and so the first point I want to make is that God has called us to a higher calling, okay, God has called us to a higher calling, and that phrase or that term higher calling literally means this, it means a call to perfection, a call to maturity, and a call to holiness. Perfection, maturity, holiness. A lot of times people struggle with that whole idea of perfection because it's like, hey, oh, you mean you're perfect? I can never be perfect. And so we draw this conclusion, since I never can be perfect, why even try? Well, that word perfection, and it does mean holy or holiness, but for our benefit, it means to mature. God is calling us to be mature. And as I said in Philippians uh, 3.15, as we talked about laying hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of us, uh, that's not just something that's only for apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. That's the call of God upon all of our life, the high call of God in Christ Jesus. And as I said, verse 15 said, therefore let as many of us as are mature have this mind. So you've got to realize that God is calling us to a place that, you know, is it okay if I pray an imprecatory prayer? Is it okay if I pray? Well, you'll have to deal with that between you and the Lord. But I believe when it comes to the New Testament teachings, God's calling us to a higher calling. And we really need to take a look at our own lives and we need to take a look at our own motives and say, what's really bugging me today about this? What's really irritating me? Is it because I can't do what I want to do? Or is it because I really feel somebody is calling me to violate you know, the, the principles and the convictions that I should have in my life or have in my life as a believer? So anyhow, Matthew 5, 43 for 48, says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? And then here's verse 48. It says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. He, he defines this responding to those who persecute us, responding to those who curse us, responding to those whose motives may be very, very impure and come against us, really kind of like the, 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 the person or the people that I think David was referring to in Psalm 109, but the Lord tells us here, he says, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray for them. I want you to bless them. I want you to love them. But then he wraps it all up in this. He says, because this, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Or you shall be holy just as your Father in heaven is holy. Or you shall be mature. You shall be mature. God's calling us to a level of maturity whereby we can literally address matters like this in our life the way Jesus would address them. And uh, that's... Uh, uh, that's the calling on our life today, is not what's allowed. What will God allow me to do? He says all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. What is it that God wants me to do so that I can exalt the kingdom and lift up the glory of the Lord in my prayers as well as in my life? So the higher call, 
The second thing is, is what spirit is motivating you? You know, we need to always check our heart and examine our heart and say, what spirit is motivating me to be considering uh, praying maybe a judgment or a curse upon a governor or a leader that is not com complying with what we feel is you know, God's will for us as far as our gathering together. Luke 9, 51 through 56. It says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? I, I want to point this out. Here James and John are coming, and they again, they're looking back to an Old Testament situation. We know 1 Kings 18 and 19, when Elijah dealt with the prophets of Baal and called down the fire from heaven and all that took place there and took the sword and killed those prophets from Baal and whatnot. And so these disciples, they're thinking in terms of that. And they're thinking, well, maybe we should do what Elijah did in the Old Testament when he did that. Maybe we should call fire down from heaven uh, against these, uh, these Samaritans that are not accepting you for who you are and they're rejecting and they're resisting and so on and so forth. Verse 55, this is what Jesus says. It says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit that you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. So again, Jesus comes along consistent with what we read here in Matthew. And he's basically saying, hey guys, there's a higher calling on you. There's a higher calling on us in the day that we're living in. This isn't about somebody disagrees with us, somebody has another point of view, somebody maybe even resists what's going on. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to let them have it. We're going to pray that God would open up the ground and suck them down in it. We're going to pray that God would send lightning, you know, on their house or whatever it is. I mean, that's what they were asking. They were sincere and they were drawing off of an Old Testament situation uh, that they were, you know, thinking, hey, th this isn't I feel, I think, we discussed it. This is, hey, Elijah did this. Should we do this also? But Jesus addressed them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are. And so I ask when it comes to the way we pray, we pray when we get agitated or aggravated with people in our life, and it doesn't have to be a governor, and it doesn't have to be during the coronavirus. We, these things go on in our life. It could be a boss. It could be a neighbor. It could be whatever. We really need to look in our heart and ask ourselves that question. What spirit is it that's causing me to consider the prayer that's coming to my mind to pray? Along with that, 1 John 4, 6 and 7 says this, We are of God, he who knows God hears us, he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And then he goes into, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everybody love is born of God. Once again, in the context of love, the Lord says, you've got to check what spirit. There's different spirits functioning today. There's the spirit of truth and there's the spirit of error. Uh, you know, he, he didn't necessarily say that this is a demon spirit. He's saying there is a spirit that promotes truth. And then there is a spirit that promotes error. And even as believers, again, 1 John, that's written to the church. We've got to realize that sometimes the spirit of error can be functioning or influencing my life that I will draw conclusions that are not accurate for me to draw. So that I need to make sure that when I think I'm hearing from God, that I need to make sure that it's a spirit of truth and that that spirit is consistent with the truth of God's Word. Okay, the third thing is, when it comes to considering these prayers, is who is my enemy? Okay, who is my enemy? Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, it doesn't say the wiles of, you know, somebody who disagrees with you. It doesn't say the wiles of the unbeliever. Uh, it says the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You need to stop right there. Because when we're talking about these kinds of prayers, we are, what, what we're, what's being referred to is prayers against 
people, bringing judgment on a particular individual or a group of people that, are, that we believe are, are either instruments of the devil or whatever the case might be. But the Lord says right here, listen, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The issue here is not the individual, no matter how wicked, no matter how ungodly, no matter how resentful, no matter how you know, they're coming against us, that is not where this battle is being fought. And so, you know, you remove somebody and somebody else goes in, and I think we found out the older you live that uh, things don't change a whole lot. I mean, there are people that are pretty well out there on the left and pretty out much on the right, but overall, uh, you don't even know who that person's going to get replaced by if God judged them and something happened, you know, that would end their influence in the matter. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we've got to understand, yeah, are there prayers that we need to pray uh, uh, that are aggressive? Are there prayers that we need to pray coming against? Are there prayers that we need to pray casting down? Absolutely, but not people. They're not to be prayed against people. They're to be prayed against powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness, <coughs> excuse me, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so my enemy is not some person who is resisting me or resisting the Lord. That is not my enemy. Number four, who is called to judge? Because when you start praying prayers of judgment, you're putting yourself in the judgment seat. I'm deciding that the, the, what God really wants in this situation is for this person to be removed for this person to get cancer, for this person to get hit by a car, for this person to be, you know, whatever it might be, we're making that determination on our own. And Matthew 7, 1 and 2 says this. <coughs> Excuse me again. Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So God tells me that when I'm <clears throat> thinking, when I'm speaking, when I'm praying, when I'm preaching, whatever I'm doing, he says, don't be judgmental. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need to judge between good and evil and right and wrong. I don't need to determine and say, oh, well, I must be that <clears throat> it's okay. It, it might not be according to the will of God, but I don't need to pray judgment to come down because I need to realize that God, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. I need to realize that God might be actually using this difficult time, and personally, I believe that He is, <clears throat> that God is using this to not only uh, uh, address His church and to bring us into a clear alignment with His Word, with His purpose, with His love, and then reaching out and touching people who are lost or backslidden and uh, wanting to draw them into the kingdom. <clears throat> so I do believe the Lord is using it, but God's got to be the one that brings judgment on things. Genesis 18.25, this is the one Old Testament verse that I'm using, and it's really just to define who the judge is. It says, far be it from you to do such a thing. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah with, with the conversation Abraham was ha having? Uh, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Okay? There is a judge over all the earth, and it's not me, and it's not you. There's a judge over all the earth, and it's God. And will he not do right? And so even in Abraham's case there, <clears throat> Abraham didn't come and say, okay, God, you know, let him have it down there. Go, go get him. Uh, but he said, you know, hey, God, uh, you're the judge of all the earth. I know that you'll do the right thing. And he began to plead for those uh, people that were there and of course the righteous the Lord brought out and then he brought judgment It's not that God doesn't bring judgment, but Abraham didn't bring that judgment That was God's judgment because he is the judge of all the earth and then 2nd Corinthians five ten, For we must all appear Where before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done Whether good or bad there is going to come a day of judgment And then that day of judgment everybody's going to get judged and everybody's going to get judged righteously. And those that have walked in faith and communion with the Lord and through the blood of Jesus, they're going to be judged <clears throat> uh, innocent. They're going to be judged righteous. And uh, they're going to, we know they're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Those who haven't are going to be judged harshly. And so once again, though, that's not my, that's not my call. That's not my, uh, I'm glad that God hasn't given me the authority to judge. 
uh, or the power even to judge. Uh, and so that's his business. God is the judge of all the earth, the righteous judge of all the earth. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord says, hey, hey, hey guys and girls, judge not so that you be not judged. Number five, God is also a deliverer. So typically, I mean, the situation David was in in Psalm 109, David was in circumstances where he was being oppressed. He was being pressed. He was being attacked. He was being ostracized. He was being ridiculed. He was being cast down. Uh, and these are the kind of things that, you know, it's at those times when we're getting squeezed that, uh, you know, these thoughts tend to pop up in our mind or we tend to read these verses and start saying, oh, maybe this is what I need to do. But we need to know this, God is the deliverer. You know what? God delivered David out of all those situations. And so whether he judged that king or whether he brought a, you know, a curse on somebody, whatever, uh, <clears throat> but he delivered David. And he's a deliverer and he will deliver the church. I'm absolutely confident that no matter what's going on, God is going to deliver us through this time and we will end up in better situation than we were coming into it. Let me read 2 Peter 2, 6-9. It says God, referring to God, and again, it's going back talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, but in the New Testament. God, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So there again, God, uh, we don't see Abraham praying and asking for God to judge that area, but he did. He delivered, and then he judged. Verse 7. It says, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And then verse 9, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So that's telling me that God knows how to deliver us. Uh, if it was really, really significant, you know, that uh, <clears throat> things go back to the way that they were by tomorrow, God could make that happen. I don't think that's what God's doing in this day. I think he's told us enough, you know, by the prophets of old, of things that will be going on in the end times. Uh, I hope that we all know that it's not, a, it's not called the great picnic, okay? It's called the great tribulation. And so things are going to be happening in the end times that are going to be extremely difficult. They're going to be the byproduct of man's sin, byproduct of man's rejection of God. But God will deliver. Just as he judged Egypt, keep in mind that he delivered Israel. And we are the New Testament Israel in that respect. We are the covenant people of God. And so God will deliver us. So I don't need to spend my time cursing governors, okay? I need to spend my time walking with Jesus. I need to spend my time loving God. I need to spend my time seeking the Lord. And I need to spend my time reaching out to my community and praying for them that God would touch their life. And then the last one, number six, our call to suffer persecution. You know, we are actually have a calling to suffer. And a lot of people don't like that. They don't like that verse. They don't like that concept. They like to think of it that we're the king's kids, and so therefore we're not going to have to deal with any of that kind of stuff. I am a king's kid. I do walk in the blessing and the provision of God. Uh, I, I thank God for uh, his resources in my life, both natural and supernatural all the time. But at the same time, I don't have a conflict with the necessity uh, of suffering in the house of the Lord. Jesus suffered, okay? And again, he took upon himself my sins, and he took upon himself my sorrows. But at the same time, let me read here in 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, Paul talking here, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, love, perseverance, and persecutions. Afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra. And then he says this, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me, and all who desire to live godly lives will suffer persecution. Now, Paul said that he went through persecutions. He went through afflictions. But God delivered him. It didn't say, he didn't say that God delivered me so that I didn't have to go through them. He said God delivered me from them. As I was going through them and the enemy wanted to use them and maybe the, the leaders, the kings, the governors of that day were really hoping that they could really beat him down and really you know, get him to quit and give up. 
He says, no, that's not what happened. He says, and in, the, and in season and in time, the Lord delivered me out of them all. God's a deliverer. And so God has called us to suffer, and suffering has a purpose. Suffering has a season. Because as we go through the trials and tribulations of life, and it's one of the reasons why I really felt to look in the book of James and to look at what James has to say, those gems from James that are there to help us to see how to deal with trials. How should we respond to them when they come our way? He doesn't say how to, how to live so that they won't come your way. He says when they come our way, they're going to come, and we're not going to have sometimes anything to do with that it happened. I mean, what's going on in the world today? There, there isn't, we're not all sitting around going, oh, that's what I wanted to happen. I've been praying for a virus to come for a long time. Nobody even saw it coming. But when it comes, we need to know that God's going to deliver us. And so we can walk in His deliverance. So... Uh, <clears throat> And I wrote this down just before I came up here uh, uh, tonight. If this is the worst that it gets, then I'm going to be very thankful. If this is the worst that it gets that we can't have church the way we're used to having it for a, a while, uh, I'm finding that uh, I'm, our messages are touching more people today than they ever got out to before we went on Facebook and YouTube and the, and the uh, video and so on and so forth. Way more many people. I've got people that have gotten back to me. A student from France uh, some years ago has contacted me. He's watching it. Uh, Japan, people that are our, our former students that are in other places, they're able to listen to the messages on Facebook. Uh, relatives, people are shared with. I've got family members, and, and uh, if you're out there right now listening, because uh, Heidi and Rolo, you've been very faithful to be on there. I've got family members that are able to hear the word uh, that I'm sharing that haven't been able to for all the years that we've been here uh, because there wasn't a means to get them out. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm looking at it, I'm saying, praise the Lord. I do want to get back to meeting together in the house. I do want to get back to worshiping like that, uh, you know, together. And, and we're, we're going to be, you know, making a few adjustments within the framework of what I believe are guidelines to be able to do a little bit of that. But what we need to do is rejoice in what's going on today. We need to say, thank God there are things going on that are opportunities that are there. Maybe you haven't taken the opportunities that God has given you to step out of your shell and go out and start reaching your neighborhood or reaching people at work or getting your life involved in their lives or you know, inviting them in for prayer or for whatever the case might be. And so if you're, if, if you're always focusing in on the negative, you're, you're going to be bummed out all the time. And if, yet if you take a look at things and you say, okay, there's some negativity here, but I'm going to look beyond. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What was the joy? The cross was not the joy. It was the joy that was on the other side of the cross. And we need to start looking at these things that are putting our flesh to death and rejoice that I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to be a more godly person. I'm going to be more like Jesus after this if I respond properly. And if I don't, I'm going to be sitting around wondering who I ought to curse tomorrow with my prayers. And so uh, that's one thing. And, 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 and I do ask this. If we're thinking about doing this now, what will we do if things really get bad? What are we going to do when things get, are we going to have home groups that are going to be, you know, there's a judgment group over there and there's a cursing group over there and decide which one you want to join and be a part of. I'll tell you what, I'm not interested in being a part of any of those. Our prayers shouldn't be about our preferences, but they should be about the will of God. I prefer to be in God's house. I prefer to have a full sanctuary this evening when I'm sharing this message, but that's not the way it's happening. And so I can't just focus in on my preferences. Darn it, I want people to come here and I want them to hear me preach and I want to be able to hug folks and I want to be able to, I do want to be able to do those. But that's not where my focus needs to be. My focus needs to be on God, what are you doing here? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why did you allow us to be in a state one of the handful of states that seem to be prolonging things and, you know, getting, getting harsh on things. Why is that? I mean, I'll tell you what, I'm moving to Georgia. I'm just, we're going to pack up and move this thing out. No, God's planted us here. What's he want us to do? Why is it that these things are happening from God's perspective? We need to look at things from God's perspective. And the last point I want to make is, uh, uh, and again, I jotted this down just before I came here tonight, inconvenience doesn't justify disobedience. Okay, it's inconvenient right now. We're going to have we're going to gather in the parking lot on Sunday, but we're going to need to stay in our cars. 
we're going to need to apply some rules that uh, I feel God put in my heart to let everybody know that if we're going to come and do this thing, there's going to be a way that we're going to do it. And it's going to be a little bit more inconvenient than just parking, getting out of the car, kids go to the swing set, we come in here, talk about you know, what's going on in life, and so on and so forth. Uh, inconvenience, but that doesn't justify disobedience. I taught about what I believe the standard should be some weeks ago when we started to go into this thing as to how we should respond to some of these rules and regulations that are going on, and we really need to deal with things one day at a time. That doesn't mean that things can't change tomorrow by the Holy Spirit or through the government or whatever the case might be. So with that, I'm going to leave you to draw your own conclusions about the imprecatory prayers and whether you feel God would have you be praying them or not. Uh, if you feel God has told you to pray them, uh, then I say go ahead, I guess, and be obedient to God. I just struggle sometimes when people feel God's calling them to be disobedient to His Word because I know God's Word is truth. It's always truth. And I know that someone who says one thing and then the next minute uh, says something different is somebody who's confused and I don't think God's confused. And so I think when he gave us his word, he gave us these scriptures. There's probably others we could look at to help interpret and discern what God is calling us to in this day and in this hour concerning how we pray. Because I'll tell you what, church, we need to be praying. Absolutely no doubt about that. Prayer is what God has called us to do. And we need to be praying for God to pour out his spirit and move and do great things. And so uh, I'm going to uh, pray right now. I'm going to close in prayer. And then I do want to give just a few announcements to remind everybody what's going on here um, uh, in the next, few, uh, next week, the next few days, so on and so forth. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I do ask, Lord, that... Lord, this was a good question that was asked, and it was probably a question that's asked... Uh, maybe many people have this in the back of their mind, wondering about these kind of, you know, well, David prayed this, what should I do? And Elijah prayed that, maybe we're supposed to be doing that. And God, I don't want to come here acting as if I'm the one that knows everything. But Lord, these scriptures and these points you've put in my heart, Lord God, concerning this question that was asked. And uh, as I considered it and as I prayed and spent time with you, Lord God, I, I just felt that you guided and directed me to these verses and these thoughts, Lord God. And I do ask that, Lord, those that are, because I know this is sincerity, these are sincerely being asked. I ask that those that are even considering this, or maybe I just raised the question today, Lord God, for them to begin to contemplate that you, through the Word and by the Holy Spirit, Lord God, would speak and bring clarity to each individual, to each person, as to your call upon their lives and our lives to be men and women of prayer and that the church be a house of prayer. And so, Father, I ask these things today, and I ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very quickly, just a reminder that, uh, again, Pastor Kathy McBride is going to be bringing the message forth this Sunday morning. Really looking forward to hearing it. Uh, just a dear sister in the Lord, pastor, and uh, uh, it's nice to bring. You know, we, 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 the ministry that we have come here is is the vast majority of it is men. It just functions that way. Now we have husbands come and their wives, and we've, uh, you know, we're we're very close with families. Uh, but to have uh, Sister Kathy come and just to bring the the word of the Lord uh, is just a, a refreshing thing. And just want you to know that 10:30 on Sunday morning uh, on Facebook and on YouTube will be our service, our Sunday morning service. Uh, Monday on Monday for Treasures of Truth. Christian Pimentel is going to be bringing the word on Monday night at 7 p.m. Uh, Wednesday is when I'm going to begin uh, uh, the series uh, Gems from uh, James and Profiting from Trials. I'll be talking, talking next Wednesday about profiting, profiting from trials. And then <clears throat> next Friday, uh, I want to share, and this, this will, I, I'm going to have to start Gems from James and then pop out for just one evening because I, I really feel that there's something that I want to share uh, that is something pertinent to where we're at today also, maybe even a little bit in line with uh, what I shared tonight, and that is uh, yielding your rights. Yielding your rights. You know, in this country, we've got to thank God for the Constitution. I thank God for the Bill of Rights. I thank God for all of those governing documents that we have uh, written down uh, and there to uh, hold government accountable, really, when it comes to decisions that they make and so on. We have states, you know, state government, federal government, of course, county government, and so on. 
Uh, but is there ever a time that I can point to something and say, that is a right that I have. And God has given me that right right there. But he would call me to yield that right. Okay, because we have a tendency to stand for our rights. We fight for our rights. Our, cover, our, our country was built on those who stood and fought for their rights. Uh, our government institutions were, were put together and defined the way that they were in these documents so that people you know, could, have, uh, could function in their unalienable rights. But is there ever a time that God would have me to yield those rights for the kingdom of God? Is there ever a time that there's something lawful, but there's something that's more expedient? I want to talk about that uh, uh, on, uh, on, on next Friday night uh, for Treasures of Truth. And then uh, next Sunday, Sunday the 31st, we will be uh, gathering for a drive-in service here at the church. Uh, drive-in service, uh, drive-in dinner, lunch afterwards from our cars. And, uh, uh, you know, we're just working out the details for that thing. The only thing that would stop that from happening would be inclement weather. And so uh, you'll want to be in touch and listening or ke- catching the text that I send out this week and messages on uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube also, keeping you up to date because as you know as well as I do, the weather changes around here or the prognostications do every day. So uh, we'll be keeping an eye on things like that too. But we're, we're hoping, we're praying, we're believing that we can come together and uh, 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 have a great time uh, together uh, here uh, uh, outside and uh, uh, in worship and in praise and, and uh, fellowshipping the way that we can uh, in a safe way. So God bless you. We look forward to seeing you Sunday morning in Jesus' name.